So we spent the last year, a uh, year and a half, with our team in South Korea, really investing in material science and testing all different combinations for the concrete ink. Testing things like speed, saturation, how much moisture to use. You can see the color changes and the differences between the different mixes that we tested out for flowability, for hardening strength, um, compression, shrinkage, how much PSI does it hold. Um, and we did everything a few layers at a time to see how the layers stuck to each other. We would do breaks in between. We would see how much time can go from one layer to the next. Our main goal here is to make 3D construction printing a viable option for projects in the future. Make sure that it's safe, it's sustainable, and offers a good alternative to the technology that's out there today. We found out very early on um, with a lot of the mixes, if you're doing short runs, you have to be careful, making sure that all the layers can actually support themselves as you go up. You test things like how easy is it to crack, and if you see here, we've tested all different kinds of fibers. Throughout different days, we have our printer set up outside. We want to replicate a real job site, and we know there's going to be real issues with temperature, humidity, so we do change the ratio around. But we've had a lot of fun here just experimenting. If we know a mix isn't working, we try to figure out what we can do to make it work or to what aspect it's not. And if you look at this example here, you can see that not only did it bond as one layer, it didn't really support itself on each, but also it was a windy, rainy day that day. Um, so we knew we had to change the formula. At times when we're doing our test prints, if we're doing tiny runs, um, like even a wall this big, if we're going back and forth, or if we're doing multiples in a row, by the time it swings back around, we have to make sure the layer below hardens in time. So we've spent a lot of time on that. We do recognize that sometimes on one-offs and examples, even some of the furniture stuff over there, we might use a hardener or an accelerant in between. So we've continued to do experimentation with different wall shapes and configurations. We do an inner and an outer wall connected. Initially, we were doing a zigzag shape in between. And you might see on some of the videos or some of the leaked footage online of our printers. We actually came up with a better, more affordable way. Everyone in the industry touts that 3D construction printing can be more affordable. We're setting out to prove it, that it's not only more durable, um, more resilient, better for different types of environments, but also you can eliminate a lot of the cost by just printing the outer and inner wall and planning ahead in the CAD diagram. We in Black Buffalo, we explore different uh, material delivery system and extrusion system. This is uh, our uh, latest like, extrusion system. This part is the hopper of the material, which we, uh, and this is the main extrusion system, which we use for uh, depositing the layer. We have three cameras. This one monitor the level of the material inside the hopper, and the rest of them, they are constant. We are constantly monitoring the quality of the layer and printed part. We also impl start implementing a new hose management system which basically uh, simplifies the delivery of the material from the pump and mixer to the hopper. To improve the structural performance of this uh, 3D printed wall, we use this Nora wall, which is very common in construction practice, and put them every 10 to 12 inch horizontally, basically, uh, connect two uh, layers of the printed uh, structure together and make a homogeneous structure before we pour the concrete inside. What's the speed? 8, 8, 8, 8. Uh, other companies that they are using like a zigzag printing in the middle. The problem with that one is uh, the main problem is basically wasting a lot of concrete for the connection and it doesn't have that structural performance that we expect. This durable has been uh, used in the construction practice for years and has shown its integration with concrete structure. So we can use that one way more efficiently, way cheaper and the result is going to be way more stronger structure. For our 3D printing operations, um, it's uh, it's basically a mortar pump, okay? Uh, and in terms of uh, 3D printing, you know, 
depending on the materials that we've been developing and things like that, it's, it, it can often give the, this little pump a difficult time. Uh, a, in terms of mixing the material, uh, the, in terms of the water injection stage, sometimes material gets caught um, or it gets backed up. And so there's inconsistencies in terms of how it injects the water with the, with the dry material. When we're operating this pump, what we really have to be cognizant of, we have to be keep monitoring the uh, material uh, and visually inspecting it to make sure that we see the right consistency, consistency that we want. And uh, basically, whenever we see it deviate from that, uh, we got to make adjustments on the fly, manually, um, whether it be to uh, kind of jostle up the material inside here to keep it flowing constantly, or if it's adjusting the water flow here to make sure we have the right uh, uh, water um, to uh, dry mix ratio. Um, and then you got a whole host of other concerns that have uh, are directly related to printing, setting up, cleaning up, um, all these different considerations to keep this machine in uh, basically tip-top work in order, uh, a lot of things you got to consider. Um, there are also times where in terms of uh, our printing uh, protocol, uh, we have to rest, okay? Layer time or uh, time between layers, resting between layers and whatnot. And uh, because of the nature of the material, um, Every second you're waiting is kind of like a, 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 a bomb clock, you know, ticking down till when, till uh, the point where I, the material down here at the pump where it comes out uh, freezes or solidifies just enough to make it uh, basically uh, put you dead in the water. Secondly, anywhere along the hose and the machine, uh, we could get a clog anywhere in there, and for every second we're waiting. So it's a careful, it's a very uh, careful uh, uh, balance that we got to do. It's a very, like a dance between the guy at the nozzle, the guy at the machine, the, the guy or the crew at the pump. Um, so the whole host of uh, things to uh, take, take into consideration. Um, some, I think internally what we like to say is that the pump really is the heart of the whole uh, 3D printing system. Uh, this, this keeps the, the blood flowing essentially, yeah, so to speak, um, and uh, any you know, blockages or stoppages, they all start from here. So the material starts here, but I mean, whatever you get out here is whatever you get out over here on the print tab. So, talk about the next show. Yeah, talk about how we're breaking the improvement and what we're finding. You did a great job talking about the negatives, now talk about how you're gonna fix it. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the wear That way we end on a positive note. Yeah. Oh, okay. A lot, um, a lot of wear and tear too, we have to change almost uh, every component that we're supposed to change. <laughs> After um, how, many, how many months do you have it in this one? Uh, Three months? Well, considering this 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 unit, <laughs> uh, this unit has held up pretty well because, uh, admittedly, you know, at the beginning we were also very, we were also learning on how to use the pump, right? So um, uh, after a while, though, uh, once we got the hang of it, uh, figured out the nuances of how it worked. Um, as with any machine, right? Whether it's whether it's your car or an elevator system or whatever, there, uh, there's a way it's designed and there's a, uh, how it's intended to be used, right? A, a schedule of maintenance, a schedule of use. Um, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't drive your car for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, after, you, for sure, it's gonna break down, right? Same deal with this guy. This guy has an operating period and uh, uh, it, it, needs, it needs to cool down. Uh, just like any other machine, even even what we have to do here, sometimes a nozzle, we got to make sure after a while, the material gets clumped up, the same way it gets clumped up here, we got to break, wipe it out, start fresh, make sure we make sure we've got optimal operating conditions. Same thing with with this pump or any other pump for that matter, any other machine. So, Can you sorry. talk about the, uh, the so you'll use a different pump in the future? Can you talk about some of the differences of the different pump and how sure. that'll improve your prints? Yeah, yeah. One thing we found about this pump is that uh, the, uh, first of all, the, the water injection stage, um, we would like it for it to be not just shooting water at the material, but maybe have something like uh, a better system where the water uh, uh, does an initial kind of mix on its own flowing power with the material first. That way when it enters the mixing, uh, the actual mixing stage, it's not a wet, dry, wet, dry. It's more of a, it's more of a homogenous mix first, initial mix, and then down here it gets churned more. Secondly, with this machine, 
Uh, we'd also like for the mixing station itself to also be longer or the material to spend a little more time in there. Um, we have learned, however, though, that this uh, this this uh, uh, this pump has a lot of different options, right? A lot of different attachments we could do. And we actually today tried a, a, a new one that we just got, which is um, uh, a better. What, what we the, this uh, mixing paddle that we got here is a uh, is a is a better implementation of something we just rigged up in house. We had an earlier version or a simpler, a simpler paddle version with only one fan or paddle. Sure. We welded on another one. Whereas this one's got uh, a beefier one, it's got two, it's got uh, a couple other features that I think today definitely helped in making the mix be more consistent here and as it came out the hose. Um, now in terms of the future, yeah. uh, what we'd like to do is, um, this is the only pump we've worked with so far. We've researched other pumps and you know, for various considerations or whatnot, we chose this one. It had the, at the time, uh, the best uh, kind of um, combination of, of cost, uh, features, um, and specs. So uh, it seemed like it, this would work uh, pretty well. Um, and uh, as we continue to do our research, we found other, uh, other pumping options. One of the things we, we looked into also in, the, uh, in our pump research was, should we separate uh, the mixing station and the pumping station, there's a pumping station down here. One of the things we really liked about this unit was that it was together. It was one unit, we only had to buy one machine, it did the mixing and the pumping. But as anyone can tell you, uh, the more features you add on to a machine or a system, uh, typically uh, the performance of each separate function kind of uh, uh, suffers a little bit, right? Yeah, a lot of people say, you want, you want, if you want to do something good, you do one thing, you do one thing really well. Right, once you start adding on to that stuff, can kind of get uh, deteriorated performance in all areas. So um, one of the things we were looking at in the beginning was, uh, should we separate the mixer from the pumping station, have a separate machine, and just uh, do a systems integration kind of thing? Um, for various considerations like cost, now you gotta get two machines, and you gotta do, uh, uh, develop the, uh, the integrator. Um, so uh, what we just, the road we decided to go down for now is to try to see what, uh, um, single unit systems that are out there. And another one we found, which we were able to, kind of, uh, we were lucky enough to get a loaner on um, and test out, had a lot of the things, different the things that we were looking for. A longer mixing station, even a longer injecting station. Uh, the injection system itself was very different from this one. Uh, it, gave, it gave the material an opportunity to, to kind of churn with the water a little bit before it got into the actual mixing station. So um, it also had a bit of a, bit of a beefier motor to, uh, to pump because in terms of our machine, you know, one of the things that we're trying to uh, accomplish was to, to uh, print two stories or higher. Now, as you go higher, you're gonna have to send the material higher. So naturally, you're gonna need a stronger pump. Um, so this, this little guy has been taxed a bit as we raise the, uh, ho our hosing higher and higher and higher. Uh, we believe that other pump uh, may have a little bit more oomph to it to be able to go that distance and really get the material out to where we need it. Every day, every single time we use this, uh, we learn something brand new. Um, and it's really because it's the nature of this type of technology. It's never been done before. Uh, the material science, as any cement specialist will tell you, nobody really knows exactly how cement works. It's been in use for a thousand, uh, at least a thousand years. Um, and uh, I, I believe in, within the past 50 to 100 years or so, Scientists have, have only begun to start learning really what it is that makes cement uh, uh, act the way it does, do the way it does, come out the way it does. And there's a lot of tweaking we can do. So uh, just as with the material, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, processing the material is a lot of trial and error. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interaction that's required, required between the material scientists, the mechanical engineers, the designers, the machine designers, to really get the right combination of uh, machine technology and uh, material technology. So, I um, mean, I mean, in terms of just the uh, the mixing, the pumping uh, station, for in terms of uh, the development that we're doing, again, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, obviously, of course, you want to do as much as much theory and put it down on paper as possible. Uh, but as with anything, um, real life doesn't always follow what, what you uh, put on paper, what you try to plan, right? So uh, every time we're learning something new, and uh, as with any uh, uh, um, uh, rigorous kind of um, design or development process, you feed that back in 
redo your numbers, redo your uh, your theory, your calculations, go back at it again. Uh, but each time, the hope is it's, you're tweaking something different. You know, like um, uh, doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity or, or whatever, right? So uh, what we're always trying to do, the, the good thing about, or the nice thing about trial and error is that um, coupled with you know, planning and theorizing is uh, the ability to feed that back into your model, tweak the model, try, come out with a new result, learn something new, and further and further, step by step, uh, get uh, uh, improve your process, improve your uh, material, improve your technology, and come to where you uh, reached, uh, you know, until you reach reached your goal. So, just as a quick example, one of the things we actually, uh, I think we learned um, just today, really, was that this guy, one of the features that's lacking is that we don't have a vibrator on this thing. So what ha tends to happen is that up front, the dryer material gets clumped up and it creates an air pocket. So um, through, like, like I said, through trial and error, we, 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 we uh, discovered that, oh, okay, that was, that's, that, that, that's what was causing some of the uh, discrepancy in terms of the water to dry material here. It was getting watery. So, um, tweaks we learned in our process. We agitate it here anytime we see that, and then um, uh, that's proved to be, that's proved to uh, provide much better uh, 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 control over the material that we're able to kind of send uh, to the hopper. We're in a really exciting position because we just uh, finalized the design of the next generation for this guy, the one that was actually going to be commercialized and is going to be sent out into the world. Um, that's got a lot of improvements, again, from the trial and error we've done, the development we've done. We've fed it back into the design loop uh, and made the uh, uh, corresponding adjustments and improvements to the next design. Um, and it's not just about the design of the machine itself, it's the design of the interaction between each of the different subsystems. So really it's a lot of uh, it's heavy uh, systems integration uh, design and stuff like that. I mean, today, despite uh, the challenges with the weather, it's an extremely hot day today. You've got both personnel fatigue, you've got motors overheating, you've got the heat to worry about in the hose, with the material possibly uh, setting too fast or whatever. We had a successful print today because of all the lessons we've learned that uh, allowed us to make these adjustments and all the knowledge and the knowledge base that we've uh, 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 created. We've got a long way to go, but we've come a really long way since where, we, since where we were. So we were really lucky to find this facility when we were looking for space near our New York City headquarters. Um, we're located very close to the port of Newark. We have our uh, sister company, Isis Corporation, that's part of the HN family of companies based in South Korea. Um, and this space was just amazing. We know that we're going to be shifting production from South Korea to the United States as we scale and we continue to produce printers and sell them to contractors, development uh, companies and governments throughout the world. So we wanted to make sure we had tons of space not only for our printers, our factory uh, manufacturing, but also historically we wanted to take a building that wasn't being used and create new opportunities in the area. So we've been hiring and scaling up, um, you know, factory workers, engineers. Uh, we hope that by the time you see our video again, we're going to have a 3D printed or a modular build of our sister company as our offices here. But we worked hard as a team when we were just startup phase a year ago in the United States, just getting started in this country. Um, everyone came, all hands on deck. We fixed up the factory, but really love the architecture here. Um, I think it just says something great combining the past, uh, the present, and the future of construction all in one shot. So while we'll automate a lot of the work, we do want to create new jobs, um, create opportunities for people of all skill levels um, and education levels. So either they can design in CAD and then see something come to life, or they can be on site and supervise and make sure the machine's doing everything we programmed before. Lots of people on our board and within our partner community um, that give us advice because, you know, I'm. I'm a marketing strategy guy from software and printing on a, a two-dimensional scale. Um, we have a lot of experts here on our team with material science, engineers, uh, structural, mechanical engineers looking at the equipment, every aspect, but we're not afraid to call in experts. We really want to uh, grow the industry as a whole. 
we feel like even talking to some of our competitors and you know collaborating is beneficial to everyone at this stage in the game and we're going to do what we can to con continue investing on human capital material science and our a technology for the equipment side to make it a viable future for 3D construction.